Sure. Um, well, I'm a, I'm a visual artist as well as an arts educator. I teach art at the college level and I'm also an arts writer slash, I don't like the word critic, so I'll just say <laughs> art writer. <laughs> um, and I my, did my graduate work in 2001 and so I have been teaching and exhibiting and practicing since then. And my work is, I, I, I identify as a conceptual artist. And although I'm trained in, you know, specific media, I really look at the particular concept or idea and then determine uh, what materials is going, are going to, or, and processes are gonna best serve that idea. So a lot of my work ends up uh, being interdisciplinary and multi, using multimedia. I do do a lot of uh, performance slash video, as well as sculptural installation, aspects of photography. I've also danced my whole life, and so um, I volunteer teaching dance to incarcerated teen girls, and that's part of my practice. So I, I try to, for years, I isolated all different aspects of my practice, like this is this part of my life, and this is this part of my life, and I realized it's all, you know, very holistic. So in terms of my my uh, my making, my exhibiting, my teaching, my writing, and my social activism, you know, they all feed one another. And a lot of my work, um, like you, I'm a big <laughs> situationist. <laughs> And a lot of the work is inspired by Dada and Fluxus. Probably Dada and Fluxus are definitely my two favorite art movements. And that um, influences a lot of the work. And the, this particular series, this idea of alter egos is not something that is, I mean, I've been exploring uh, it for a number of years when I was living in the Northeast. I definitely had some alter egos, but it, they really came out in full force when I moved to Texas. And the alter ego was a way of um, adopting another character and and interacting and experiencing in this case a new culture for me the texas culture um, through the lens of this this character the victorian woman and so there were i don't know exactly how many pieces but a number of them were solo and then the victorian woman and the man um, had four works together and this was the final work in that series Okay, that kind of leads me into my second question. If you just wanted to talk a little bit more about how you developed these characters, because um, I find, you know, in the video, I find them fascinating um, and was just kind of curious, like how they grew and how you developed them. Sure. Um, so in Philadelphia, so I think the Victorian woman grew out of a, uh, a few pieces that I did in Philadelphia. I was very inspired by an early Thomas Edison film called The Gordon Sisters. Um, they were early vaudeville boxers. So there is a very short video from 1901. So film had just been invented within a couple of years of the two of them boxing. And it's completely absurd. And clearly they're not trained. And so I was very interested in the, the absurdity, but also the spectacle, specifically uh, the spectacle of the woman performing for the male gaze. And I decided I had a, a friend, also an artist, and she was game to recreate the Gordon sisters. So we we actually, I tried to find, they used a backdrop, but I we went to a, you know, an estate mansion that had a similar kind of feel to the backdrop in the, early, in the um, Edison piece, and we filmed there. And we did, uh, we did a couple of other pieces. And then, you know, I kind of put her away. And so when, we, when she came out in full force <laughs> in Texas, when I moved, one of the, the first things she did was she shot a bow and arrow and then she shot guns. You can't, you can't live in Texas and not have access to, you know, firearms. 
So I set up a few rules. Well, first, if you notice her costume is not really authentic. Right. So part of, I, I'm, I'm very much interested in kitsch. And so the costume is meant to be completely ridiculous. So the, the wig, if you look at Victorian wigs, it is not, even though it said on the packaging that probably the wig was made in China, that this was a Victorian wig, this would have not been authentic to the time period. Right. And the, the material, although the design of the dress was Victorian, the material is some really awful synthetic material. Um, so she's meant to look completely ridiculous. There are many layers of petticoats and, you know, confining things under underneath to make her movement very diff difficult as she's engaging in these activities. And then, um, like Fluxus, there were a set of rules that were followed in every situation. So she never trained for any of her events. Um, there would be a 15 minute tutorial uh, prior to filming. So it was also in the spirit of Fluxus and the spirit of performance art. Um, this is not something that was scripted. It is not something that was practiced. It was very much meant to be an embodiment of this experience on the spot. Now that said, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I, I, we were safe with firearms. So I had, I have great students. I have um, sometimes get a lot of former military and I had a, a, a student who was um, uh, former military and I had asked him if he would, if he would help with the gun training. And he said, well, what kind of guns do you want to shoot? And I said, well, something that would bruise but not break my collarbone because I'm willing to suffer for my art, but not that much. Right. <laughs> so he came up, we, we ended up shooting a 12 gauge and an AR-15. And so he did give uh, you know, me or the Victorian woman a tutorial prior to filming. And you know, the videos are typically short, um, what else did I want to say about that? The, 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 the gun one was hard because I am not a gun person. And so that one was, I was very thankful to have the alter ego in place because I really think of her as this, someone who is definitely has much more courage and bravado than I do in real life, you know? So she had the permission to, to do that. And so, then I feel like I got off topic a little bit. So okay. <laughs> reel me back in, Gretchen. <laughs> so, um, and I know you talked a little bit about how like your go, your, as this character, you're participating in things that would be um, not considered to be feminine or you're trying to like cross over <clears throat> some of these perceived borders as far as what we think of as, as feminine and masculine. And I don't know if you wanted to expand on, on that idea a little bit. Sure. Um, definitely, especially the people, well, I think the whole, all of the work is about gender and about gen gendered stereotypes. And so I uh, also pushing the absurdity, you know, the absurdity of being in, it probably takes an, you know, a half an hour to put on all of the garments and everything to get ready. And, you know, so the, the ridiculous spectacle of somebody dressed in this attire and then, you know, trying to, you know, perform this activity is, is really, I think, you know, pushing the stereotype of, of gender in that way. Yeah. And then when the, the works with the man, um, we, we are very stereotypical, like the, the man, when you see that in print is always in all caps because he right. is not a man, but he is the yeah. man. He represents patriarchy and all, um, you know, white male power, so to speak, right? right? Whether that's governmental power or domestic power or institutional power, you know, he, the glass ceiling kind of power. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things uh, with my creative partner, and I believe we, we made 10 works together before we, you know, went our separate ways, was there was very, 
there was very little discussion about our characters and what our characters would do or wouldn't do. So we, we set it up as this stereotype, so to speak. And then during the course of the performances, we, um, you know, things happened that were not anticipated. So the idea behind, behind it, you'll notice in part one, as you mentioned, when uh, she's shaving him, that is a very solitary experience. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody is around, they're out in nature. It was very much supposed to be referencing uh, Samson and Delilah and the fact that when she cuts his hair, she, um, you know, claims his power. Right. And so there, there it, you know, th this was very much a, um, uh, emasculating gesture to have happen to the man and the man shows up to the bearding contest and he's clean shaven and he um he felt a little bit of animosity from some of the other uh people there that like hey dude how could you let her shave your beard like that is so wrong on so many levels and although, you know, we had the camp, we had Richard Bailey, an amazing filmmaker. I uh, work with him on a lot of projects, as many as he will work with with me. And, and that was a really challenging place to film because the lighting is really wonky. It's very crowded. So how do we kind of get a sense of the action unfolding without all of this background uh, interfering with the narrative? And there was one particular scene where they are where the victorian woman and the man are struggling and they're kind of pulling on each other back and forth now the camera is not hidden it's a big film camera that is there however you could see and you can kind of see in the background people start to stop and watch right and they're not watching the camera they are thinking that this struggle is real right. that the characters are having a real fight and they started to get up in the man's face and was like hey don't lay hands on a woman and so he's it was interesting because he started to feel very unsafe in this space yeah um as somebody who who's feeling a little bit emasculated anyway with the loss of the facial hair and not feeling love from the you know community about that and the fact that you know hey if you're gonna you know you better not touch her uh so that was very surprising to me that that whole thing transpired um and I think, uh, so since then, Colette has competed with using different uh, alter egos and creating different beards. So in three or four different beard competitions. And, and now, you know, I feel much more comfortable in that space, in that environment. And, and it is a very welcoming, warm community, especially to women. So, so you've gone that, back. Uh, <clears throat> and compete it again as yourself? Well, I, so I, I always have a character. I'm never myself, but it's, uh, she's not a fully formed alter ego like the Victorian woman okay. is. Yeah. Okay. Is that connected to the image that you have behind you now? Yeah. So I had, I was asked, this is uh, the very last piece that, uh, Adam and I did was called COG, C-O-G. And we, I was commissioned to make a work for London. And it was a, for a, a, a feminist and queer performance art event. And so I, I was inspired by this female couple um, and they, um, no, I'm like blanking on what their first, uh, their name, their way, but they took the same name. So both of them legally changed their name uh, and became known as the this, this same name, which is what we would identify with a male name. And I really, and then they published prolifically, uh, they were writers and they published, both published under the same name as well. And so it was this idea in the relationship of becoming one. What does it mean in a relationship to, to try to, you know, I guess, uh, eliminate your uh, individuality so that you can, you know, be one. 
And so in preparation for this project, I spent about three months creating the beards and the um, finding the right costumes and um, part one, they're in the dunes, the West Texas dunes, and they are struggling and they are not one at all. There's a lot of tension and a lot of strife. Uh, and then in part two, they return to the same place as old elderly people and they return to the desert to die. So in both parts, uh, we are dressed identically like twins. Um, and part of that is in embodying um, not one gender or the other, but being fluid in the uh, in that, um, feeling free to embrace what would be considered typically feminine and or masculine uh, behavior. And I will say that actually, um, my partner walk. Part of it is we had to walk in red, high heeled pumps through the desert, <laughs> and he was much better at walking <laughs> in the high heels than I was. You know, so I mean, there's a lot of comic, you know, moments in that. And then uh, when we <clears throat> premiered it in London, uh, because we died at the end of the piece, uh, I thought that it would be fitting if we. Um, showed up to the premiere reincarnated as Siamese twins. So I had the costumes from part one remade and we were all Velcroed together underneath the costume. And in London clubs, everything is very, very tight. There, there, you know, no room to go to the bathroom, the stairwells are tight. So for about six hours, we were Velcroed together. We could not go to the bathroom. We had to, you know, it was a very um, uncomfortable and interesting. <laughs> Do you think it means something specifically to be an artist within the mountain plain state? The, you know, the biennial focuses on this group of artists that's, you know, through the middle of the country. Um, and we want to celebrate the work that's happening within our, our region. Um, and then there's always these kind of conversations about like, well, what is regional art? Or, you know, what does it mean to be an artist in the Midwest? Is it different than being an artist on one of the coasts? And so I'm just getting some <clears throat> ideas from the artists of what they thought it meant. So as somebody who lived um, most of my life in the Northeast and spending a lot of time going to my undergrad in New York City. I taught for 10 years in Philadelphia. Um, there is definitely a, a, a perception, I would say, both on the Northeast and the West Coast, that that's where all of the important art is happening. And you, you see, you know, when the Whitney biennial happens, everything is coming out of either, you know, LA or New York. You very rarely see, um, even Philadelphia is not usually represented. And, and I remember when I found out we were moving to Dallas, I was teaching at University of Pennsylvania and people are like, oh no, you're going to be in this cultural wasteland. You know, there was just really all of this negative negativity surrounding it. And I have to say that, um, I've lived a lot of different places. People are the nicest here than I have met anywhere else. It was very easy to connect with the artist in town. It's an open community as opposed to, you know, some of the other places I've lived have been kind of closed and hard to break in. Um, it was easy for me to get connected um, with a writing gig. I started with a, a co-op gallery so people would get to know my work. And my work really radically changed. I know for a fact that if I was still in the Northeast, I would not be making this kind of work, which is much more um, embracing humor and absurdity mm -hmm. and the performance and all of that, um, you know, has been because of, you know, this move and, and the environment with which I find myself. And I, I also find that, you know, a lot of times students inspire me. So, you know, uh, Adam was a former student of mine who had approached me after he was no longer my student and said, do you want to make some videos together? You know, and so that's how that transpired. Um, I mentioned the one student who was former military. He was my gun trainer. They, the, there was another student who was uh, a champion archer. He was the bow and arrow arrow, you know, trainer for that shoot, you know, so it's, it's, uh, I, 
I tend to respond and get inspired by what's around me. Mm-hmm. And it just, it's very, it's very vibrant. And so the longer I've been here too, I think also writing for Glass Tire, I'm able to see the breadth of work certainly coming out of Texas. Yeah. Um, and there's just really good work. Yeah. Really, really good work. And I was um, really pleased to see how, um, how strong the work was, you know, in the show. And this is, you know, again, I think the Midwest tends to get kind of a bad rap outside of Chicago, right? That people think, oh, you know, there's, you know, the work isn't as, you know, substantial or um, professional or whatever those negative stereotypes might be. And that's just not the case. Yeah. Yeah. Now that we're all stuck in our homes, is there something in particular that you're working on that (laughs) Um, with, you know, in our current, uh, situation? Yeah. So I, I had about two weeks where I did not make a single thing, probably like so many other people. I was just, I was in a little bit of panic mode and, you know, eating and drinking like the apocalypse was happening, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and then I realized, you know, this is really, my classes are all online. This is really silly if I don't take advantage of having this extra time. I think just from the commuting, the hours that I'm saving with commuting and then like a, a, the actual con- teaching contact hours, mm-hmm. I have about an extra 20 hours a week. So it's That's a, a tremendous amount. Yeah. I mean, I'm spending a lot of time in front of the computer, but I decided I have very, my studio I have kind of an office and a studio and the studio is kind of a um i'm not going to say junk repository it is a treasure repository <laughs> it's not really a functioning it's there's lots of boxes of things you know and so i said well i think i'm gonna make uh, still life still life uh, photographs as well as videos of things in my studio and uh So the first one that I made, I had a a strange, it was the dress form that somebody had made specifically for bearding when it first showed, uh, there was a, and it was made out of a tomato trellis that was bent (laughs) and a hanger. And so I used that and added uh, locks of curly blonde hair and um, a martini glass and then photographed it against pink fur and you know it really kind of embodies I to me it's Marcel Duchamp you know (laughs) I'm remaking the portrait that the Baroness Elsa von Freitag Loringhoven made of him Um, and then I had another piece with a saber-toothed cat skull um, and somebody had donated a gun without an old shotgun without a barrel uh, for a different project so I have in I have the saber tooth skull, um, the gun, and it's against this like furry leopard print fabric, you know? And so, so again, playing with absurdity, but trying to see how many different things and then using the video camera as if I'm exploring the object close up. So really, and I'm actually just using my phone. That was another thing. I gave my set, myself the direction that whatever I made had to be with my phone and not with any of my fancy equipment. So using the phone as a video to explore these objects in short, you know, and then not making it too precious or too yeah. perfect, but I'm trying to knock one out every day, every two days, you know. Oh, sounds great. Sounds exciting. 